The Hem of His Garment, An Audience with the Pope, by David Sedaris. If you were to say to me, You can be in a room with either Chris Rock or the Pope, I'd say, Chris Rock, please. Nothing against the Pope, but he's never made me laugh. Neither has he come up with a viable solution to America's gun problem, the way Chris Rock has, saying that the firearms themselves can be unregulated, but that every bullet should cost $5,000. Okay, you'd continue. Julia Louis-Dreyfus or the Pope? Oh, no question, I'd tell you. The cursing on Veep amounted to poetry, so Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Stephen Merchant or Stephen Merchant? The same goes for Stephen Colbert, Mike Birbiglia, Tig Notaro, Conan O'Brien, Whoopi Goldberg, Jimmy Fallon, Rami Youssef, and Jim Gaffigan, most of whom I know or have met at one time or another. The crazy thing is that I didn't have to choose between any of the above and the Pope. For reasons I will never quite understand, I got to be in a room with all of them, plus a hundred or so others who had also been summoned, without much advance notice, to the Vatican on a late spring morning in June, when Rome was hot but not so hot that all you could talk about was how hot it was. Like everyone I spoke to the night before our papal audience, when, minus Jimmy Fallon, the American contingent gathered for dinner, I had initially thought that my invitation, which was sent by email, was spam. Right, I said to the screen of my laptop. Nice try, Russia. I didn't click on the attachment until Stephen Colbert assured me that it was legitimate and that the Pope really did want to meet with comics and humorists from around the world in three days' time. And at 6.45 in the morning, the invitation made it sound like there'd be a dialogue as if the Pope had questions or needed to ask us a favor or something along the lines of, do you think you could maybe give the pedophilia stuff a rest? Everybody's got a Catholic clergy joke up their sleeve. Perhaps one they heard at a party. Mine is, a cop stops a car two priests are riding in. I'm looking for a couple of child molesters, he tells them. The priests look at each other. We'll do it, they say. Substitute rabbis or Baptist ministers for priests and you'll get nothing. I mean, the Catholic Church earned those laughs and every time its senior clerics look away or quietly send an offending clergyman to the back bench, it's making this scandal larger than its ministry, at least to an outsider such as myself. Can you help me turn this around, I imagined the Pope asking. How can we get back to the sex-starved nun jokes we all so enjoyed in the past? This is a man who had just been caught using an Italian word that translated to faggotry for the second time in three weeks. After our visit, which was covered by seemingly every news organization on earth, the gaffe would be brought up again and again, especially in comment sections, by people convinced that, had they been invited to the Vatican, they'd have stayed home in protest, or perhaps would have attended and then caused a scene most likely one involving paint. It didn't bother me, though. When I heard that the Pope had said faggotry, I laughed in large part because it's a funny word. Then, too, it's not something you'd call a person. It's not like, shut up fag. Rather, it connotes behavior. Take your faggotry outside, please. Pope Francis can't perform same-sex marriages, but he created a firestorm within his church by blessing gay people about to be married. If they accept the Lord and have good will, who am I to judge them? he asked in 2013. Then yes, he said faggotry, but he apologized for it. Both times. I don't think that he is a homophobe so much as an 87-year-old. 
I said what again, really? My feeling is that if you want a church that is 100% gay-friendly, go join one. There are plenty to be had, or start your own. Yes, but I want Our Lady of Sorrows to celebrate Pride Month, I can hear someone whining. It's like going to Burger King and demanding a Big Mac. If you want a Big Mac, go across the street to McDonald's. Jesus. Also, I wasn't bothered by the Pope's use of faggotry, because I'm not queer, I'm gay. The difference is that queer people are offended by just about everything. Gay people just wonder what they'll wear to the Vatican at the crack of dawn and what the proper etiquette is. If he holds out his hand, you can opt to kiss his ring, my friend Leslie, who was brought up Catholic, wrote when I told her I was going. I was raised in the Greek Orthodox Church. There we kissed the priest's hand when receiving communion, though twice I moved up a few inches and kissed his watch instead just to see how he'd react. Actually, no, another friend wrote. This pope hates having his ring kissed, so if he holds out his hand, just shake it. I was in Sussex when my invitation arrived. It was 8.30 in the morning, and by lunchtime I had my plane ticket and had booked a hotel within walking distance of the Vatican, which, like the city-states of San Marino and Monaco, is its own separate country, and could thus be added to a list I have on my computer titled Countries I Have Been To. The Vatican would be my sixtieth. There's another list on my computer titled Stars I Have Seen. People don't count if they are on stage, in a concert, or a play. They have to be at large, or at an occasion we were both invited to. According to an online article my travel agent sent, one that referred to my fellow Vatican invitees as yucksters, I'd soon be adding two American comedians, a British one, and an actress, also American, to my list. Plus the Pope, Hugh reminded me when I told him that I was definitely going. Oh, right, I said, the way I might have had he said, plus Sully Sullenberger. I guess I'd been limiting my list to entertainers and people who aren't in show business, but dazzle nevertheless, like Ann Richards, the late governor of Texas. If I don't see the Pope as dazzling, I suppose it's because I'm not religious in any way. On my deathbed, I'll likely cover my bases and beg for forgiveness, but not until I'm coughing up blood or see Hugh reaching for the plug of my respirator. Does that make me an agnostic or a flat-out atheist? I do believe there was someone named Jesus who was a revolutionary, but I don't think he was God's son or that he was resurrected. It was a shame that I was invited to the Vatican, actually, like sending me to the U.S. Open when I've never watched a football game in my life. I thought of the millions of people in the world who'd give anything to meet the Pope, and realized that I knew only two of them, my friend Ewan's cleaning lady and Stephen Colbert, who's so Catholic he taught Sunday school. The dress code on the invitation was daytime formal, which I was told amounted to shined shoes and a sh uh, the Jesus. I will leave that mistake in there because a certain viewer if you call them viewers of mine, likes it. The dress code on the invitation was daytime formal, which I was told amounted to shined shoes and a suit. The only one I had at my fingertips was bought nine years earlier when I was invited to Buckingham Palace. The late queen hosted tea parties every summer for do-gooders of one stripe or another, and I was included on account of all the rubbish I'd collected by the sides of British roads. She and I didn't meet, but I saw her. She was standing within hearing range, close enough for me to comprehend how truly tiny she was. Her feet were the size of hot dog buns. We'd been told to leave our phones and cameras at home, but everyone around me had snuck one in, and they were all going bananas. 
me, I'm not a picture person. Am I glad other people have cameras? Sometimes, like at the dinner Stephen Colbert arranged the night before our papal audience. I look at the photos of the assembled guests and wonder, what was I doing there? Why not Garrison Keillor, Tina Fey, or Donald Glover, to name just three of a thousand more qualified people? It was like a reproduction of The Last Supper, with one of the disciples replaced by Snoopy. Does anyone have a favorite God joke? Colbert asked as our final course was served. It doesn't have to be your own. For most of the evening, I'd sat across from Whoopi Goldberg, who had no appetite, and passed me all her plates after just a bite or two. That meant double servings of four separate pasta dishes, two steaks served on wraps of eggplant, four rich smothered dumplings, two tomato salads, and two cherry and goat cheese pavlovas, plus all the food I snatched from the plate of Jim Gaffigan's youngest son, who was seated to my right. Now my pants no longer fit, and my watch band was cutting off the circulation in my left hand. Even my throat was swollen. I cleared it before taking the floor. So God tells Adam, I'm going to make you a wife, a helpmate, the most beautiful woman who ever lived. She'll be terrific in bed, enthusiastic, and uncomplaining, but it'll cost you. Adam says, How much? An eye, an elbow, a collarbone, and your left ball. Adam thinks for a minute, then asks, What can I get for a rib? The polite but underwhelming response I got from people who tell jokes for a living, who fill stadiums, should have taught me a lesson. Instead, I told another one. What's the worst part of having sex with Jesus? He's always wanting to come into your heart. Thank God Colbert told a joke as well. It was, he warned us, decades old, and one of the first he ever wrote, but at least he wrote it. Mine were ones people had told me at book signings. I don't belong here, I thought, embarrassed for the upteenth time that evening. Usually, I comfort myself by remembering that everyone secretly feels out of place. Here, though, I'm pretty sure it was just me. That said, my fellow guests were welcoming, and it goes without saying terribly, terribly funny, just as they were at 6.45 the following morning, when we met at an entrance gate near the Pope's living quarters and were led to a magnificently frescoed room in the Apostolic Palace. There we joined the hundred other people who'd been invited, more international writers and comics, most of them from Italy. I knew only one, a woman named Luciana Litta... Oh, what on earth? Luciana Littizetto whom I had met years earlier in Turin. She was the only non-Vatican representative to address the crowd. That morning, her remarks lasted a minute or two and were in Italian, as were the Pope's. The assembled group stood and applauded as he entered the room and took his throne-like seat before us. It speaks to the man's humility that he allows every rank-and-file clergy member to outdress him. The cardinals were resplendent in their black cassocks, which had bright scarlet buttons and a matching sash called a fasquia. Better still were the papal gentlemen, who wore morning coats and white bow ties coupled with elaborate bibs, often with medals hanging off them. The Swiss guard looked like Renaissance-era toy soldiers in their multicolored striped outfits standing just so, with feathers in their helmets, their halberds held before them. Even the friars in their dung-colored robes and sandals were more strikingly dressed than the Pope, who looked a bit mother of the bride in a white cassock with a shawl-type thing over his shoulders. He wore a skull cap, and around his neck a cross on which you could have crucified the late Queen of England. The Pope 
read a prepared statement, of which we were each given a copy. It amounted to, Laughter makes the world go round. His voice was soft and passionless. At one point, he got a reaction by sticking a thumb above his ear and wagging his fingers, but, as one member of the American delegation said afterward, we really just laughed out of politeness. The part that moved me took place after his address, when, row by row, we were led up the aisle and personally greeted. The Pope remained seated and shook each of our hands. Some people brought him gifts, others leaned in to tell him something. I think I said thanks for having me. Standing before him, I felt the same pity I'd felt for the Queen and would feel for anyone who has to meet people for a living. Nothing stirred inside of me the way that it did in 2015, when, rounding a corner at the White House, where I'd been invited to talk with some speechwriters, I happened upon President Obama. For a moment, standing there with my mouth hanging open, I feared that I might spontaneously combust, with respect, with pride, and all. The encounter with the Pope, though, was like meeting the Dalai Lama, not an inconvenience by any stretch, not uninteresting, just, oh, hi. Many people, after the handshake, walked a few steps, pulled out their phones, and then took a selfie with the Pope in the background. It was so tacky. I said to the Italian seated to my right, you'd think he was Santa. As at any good fashion show, the majority of our time was spent waiting, but the clothes we saw made it all worthwhile. The difference, I thought, was that these outfits weren't for sale. Then my friend Austin wrote from the States and told me that while in Rome I had to go to Gamarelli, a bespoke tailoring business founded in 1798 that's been dressing the Pope and his associates for generations. It wasn't too far from the hotel, so late in the afternoon I went with Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who wore great clothes and was seemingly up for anything. I'd worried on the walk over that Gamarelli wouldn't sell to laymen. I'm going to tell them that my brother is a priest, I said to her, that he's my same size, and I thought this might make for a good Christmas present. I figured they must hear that a lot, though, so when the time came, I told the salesman, who was young and slender and spoke very good English, that I collect religious garments from around the world. He's actually a noted historian, Julia said. I looked at her like, fuck, if I wanted to be put on the spot like this, I'd have come with my sister Amy. I also study history, the young man said. What is your area of concentration? I panicked. Sometimes I write for magazines, I told him. What I wanted was a black cassock. That's the ankle-length robe Catholic priests wear. I wanted one because they're slimming, they're classic, and they're beautifully made, at least at Gamarelli. We start by choosing the wool, the young man said, handing me a book of fabric samples. Then we select the buttons and take your measurements. A Gamarelli cassock generally takes months to make and involves several fittings. The price, which is steep, reflects the high quality of work that goes into it. That said, it's not as involved as a bespoke suit. There are no pants to worry about, no zippers in this case, but it is intricately pleated and lined. I was still willing to go ahead with it, and was being measured when the young man left the dressing room and returned, with a cassock that was already finished, but had never been collected. Perhaps the priest who ordered it had died or had been sent to prison. Whatever the case, it fit me very well, except for the length, which could easily be adjusted. Next came the Roman collar. The outfit's fine without it, I thought, until I added it and realized, whoa, you really need the collar. 
Then came the Fascia, and I got two, the classic black one and a scarlet model that a cardinal would wear. Is it against the law to dress like a priest? I whispered to Julia as I did up the last of the thirty-nine buttons, each of which symbolized a year of Jesus' life and leaves you wishing he had been crucified at twelve, especially if, like me, you're developing arthritis in your fingers. I loved the idea of wearing my cassock on the street. Then I imagined myself walking along and being approached by a person in distress, or worse yet, by another priest asking me if I had heard the news about Father O'Shea or Archbishop DiMaggio. A cardiac arrest, not two minutes into the Eucharist. What does one say in that situation? Oh, sorry, I honestly just like the robe. It takes ten pounds off. The next day at the airport, awaiting my flight back to London, I saw a priest wearing the very outfit I had beside me in my suitcase. He was heavy set and bearded, his black hair gathered in a short ponytail. What's it like to know that you can never marry or even date someone, I wondered. More than that, what's it like to have faith? To look at a solid argument against your God and say with absolute conviction, I think I prefer it my way, thank you. My Greek grandmother was like that, kept a crucifix the size of a hand mirror in her bedroom and kissed it until her lips wore off the plating on Jesus' stomach. Cried when she saw Billy Graham on TV, even though she didn't understand what he was saying. Jesus bless thee, she'd whisper, crossing herself whenever we passed a church, any church. Tie two sticks together, and her eyes would water. My father had maybe a third of her faith, and his children, for whatever reason, none. I wanted to tell the priest at the airport that I had just met his boss, the Pope, that I'd shaken his hand and been given a rosary in a leather pouch. Without seeming creepy, I then wanted to ask what he was wearing beneath his cassock, underwear and a t-shirt, cut-off shorts, dress slacks, jeans. Is it every man for himself, or are there rules? I hated to think I was missing something. Thank you for not missing that, and for listening. <laughs>